so after this uh, light lunch, I will carry out, uh, carry on with our presentation. So we will start with the session four of this workshop, which is uh, entitled "New Perspective in Archaeological Research." We'll have three uh, talks into this uh, this session, and the first talk will be by uh, my colleague uh, Christophe Potier from the EFO, uh, who actually runs the EFO Center in uh, Chiang Mai but who is actually in, uh, in Laos uh, for important uh, work, so he cannot be with us today. However, he can uh, make his presentation online. So the title of his presentation is Recent Works and New Perspective on Archaeological Mapping. So Christophe, I'm leaving you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Grégory. Uh, is it OK on the technical side? You have my screen, my face, everything. Yep. I don't hear anything in return. I guess it's fine. So um, yes, as Gregory was mentioning, unfortunately, I, I, I'm I'm not able to be with you today. Uh, I actually plan to be uh, physically with, with the, in the Serenton Anthropology Center today. Unfortunately, uh, some uh, things happened, and I had to join uh, quite urgently a mission in in Laos. So that's the reason I'm not here today. Um, but anyway, my, my talk today will be mostly about the recent works uh, we have been doing, uh, op, let's say, over the 30 last years uh, in archaeological mapping, mostly in Cambodia, but actually, as you will see, this work extended, uh, expanded during the recent time to other sites and other countries. And of course, I would like to, to start by mentioning of course, that, that that work is actually the produce of uh, the product of numerous collaborations. And I would like to um, underline here the, the work uh, and the collaboration of uh, our colleague Damien Evans, who also unfortunately is unable to be uh, with us today. Um, and he has been actually instrumental into many aspects and methods and uh, results that I will be talking about today. Um, and he's also directing some ERC uh, project, uh, ERC funded project uh, held by EFU, which are actually focusing on this uh, archaeological uh, mapping project. So let's, if I just start briefly, uh, I would like also to stress how you know, uh, working on in archaeology and history of uh, ancient civilization in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, but it's not, it goes much beyond Cambodia, including Thailand, of course, uh, always face similar uh, issues, and in particular, the, the uh, limitation of uh, sources to build uh, that history. So I know there are historians in the room and so on. And we heard a lot during the last uh, days uh, and again today uh, about historical sources, text and epigraphy, but somehow they remain quite uh, limited for many, uh, to many aspects of the civilization that it does not really give us much information about other aspects, about the human environment, uh, economic trends, social transformation, and so on. So I, I had this extract here on the screen of Georges Chedes uh, mentioning uh, how actually all these, for instance, the epigraphic data and uh, monumental remains, statuaries, and so on, give, of course, a lot of information about uh, kings, wars, religions, and so on, but they left aside many other aspects. Um, so for many um, large part of the archaeological uh, work undertaken over the last century was focusing on monumental remains. Uh, it can be stone temple, bricks and uh, bricks uh, temples and so on. But there is a kind of a monumental tropism which clearly uh, oriented the archaeological work of the century. This monumental focus is also uh, to be found, including in the, the vision, for instance, of ideology, of economy and so on. We are basically, it's, it's a tendency to look for big things, monumental aspects. Uh, this is also to be found also in the mapping uh, of what we call archaeology. And uh, for the early mapping, for instance, this one, which is 120 years old, one of the first map of Angkor, is focusing about 
temples, monuments, monumental remains like the big moat, the big canals, the big reservoirs, and so on. Uh, which is a kind of a paradox because, after all, what we are also looking for is uh, the daily life, the the civilization, the habitats of people who were, which were actually built of very perishable materials. So, uh, and and from this materials which are everything except monumental there is almost nothing remaining these days all that disappeared long ago and uh, on the surface uh, there is almost nothing in it anymore uh, just uh, uh, gentle uh, topographic uh, differences uh, which are a very important indicator for for, for archaeology so the study of topography of course, especially in Cam ancient Cambodia, but it's not restricted to Cambodia, uh, as I, uh, I will repeat over and over during that talk. The topography is an excellent indicator uh, and an archaeological marker for us to understand how uh, human civilizations actually modified its environment. That's very clear also from the air uh, where we can uh, realize especially during the ancient uh, Khmer civilization, but not only, how actually human uh, activities transform the landscape, modify deeply uh, the topography. And that's it's here very clear on that slide where we can see ponds, we can see mounds, uh, temple mounds surrounded by moats, we can see uh, more rectangular mounds which are now covered by vegetation. Uh, and these mounds were most probably platform where the villages uh, houses were built. So we, one of the, the aspects of the archaeological mapping we have been developing during the last decades was to identify this highly anthropized landscape in order to better understand the organization of these uh, settlements. Uh, Somehow, looking uh, at that feature by the sky is uh, is one of the solution, and it's an old solution. As uh, aerial reconnaissance but and remote sensing have a long history in archaeology, including in Southeast Asia, where it has been applied since the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, so, the, the, of course, the mapping evolved, and here again, I will take the example of. Ang where we concentrated most of our work. Uh, that's one of the um, uh, early maps, but this uh, has been succeeded by series and series of maps. So one of the, the, the first tasks we, we undertook somehow is to uh, assemble, uh, coordinate, uh, include all these kind of uh, different mappings into uh, a standard and consolidated database running on the GIS. And that's actually is to bring all the available sources on, on one single platform. This was particularly done in the late 90s, early uh, two years 2000. And that's, for instance, the Encore archaeological mapping, which was developed based on this uh, resource collection, remote sensing, uh, classic remote sensing, including uh, uh, radar, uh, aerial photos, uh, and um, land surveys. But of course, this mapping uh, had some limitation, and especially uh, one of the major limitations was when there was still a lot of uh, areas which were heavily covered by forest, deep forest, which uh, does not allow uh, to use uh, the capacities of Roman sensing. And that's particularly the case in Angkor, Angkor Tom, Angkor Wat, uh, which are still under heavy vegetation. Uh, fortunately, in the uh, about 12, 12 years ago, a new tool was developed and applied, enfin, applied in, archaeology, in archaeology and especially in uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, it was a site of uh, an Inca site of, uh, uh, sorry, a Maya site of Caracol in Belize, where some American colleagues in 2010 just published a paper using for the first time a large scale LIDAR mapping, uh, which actually sh show under a, a very dense vegetation of uh, Mesoamerica, 
uh, it shows very clearly the remain of the ground and it shows an interesting capacity to see under the forest. So um, in 2010, when we were there with a colleague from Sydney University, Professor Olaf Fletcher, we were very keen to apply that methodology in, uh, in Southeast Asia and especially in Angkor, where we, we have been able to build uh, an international consortium, including eight different international teams, in order to form this first LIDAR campaign in 2012, and that, which was coordinated and run by my colleague Damien Evans. Um, and then successively, uh, we have been able to have another campaign in 2015 with the uh, European Community Research Council, uh, funding. Uh, what is the LiDAR? Actually, the LiDAR is uh, what you see on the screen. It's a kind of a big pad uh, or uh, an helicopter, or it can be a plane. And, so on. and basically, in that pod, there is uh, a high precision GPS and a laser, uh, which actually send um, laser points to the ground. And and actually, the, the lidar, uh, the the laser, are reflected by any kind of object. It can be a tree, it can be the ground, it can be anything. Re uh, reflected and go back to the uh, to the antenna, and which have the capacity then to calculate very precisely the point which has been uh, touched. But actually, it does not go through the forest. The uh, interesting part is, and it's sending so many points, then. Uh, some points will pass into the gaps, into the holes between the leaves and so on, and will come to the ground. So actually, really, the radar does not go through anything. It just passes through the gaps into the canopy. And it's recording in three dimensions any kind of object, so trees, vegetation, ground, and so on. And then algorithms are able to classify these points between ground and non-ground points, so which give us uh, a possibility to identify the ground. And as such, uh, it's a kind of digital deforestation somehow. It allows us to go to see under the forest through the small gaps of the vegetation, allowing also pro uh, the production of digital terrain models, uh, which are very handy uh, to identify anthropic structure on the ground. So in the case of Angkor, I will show you some example. Let's start, for instance, with Angkor Thom, the, the city of Angkor Thom, which, as you can see here on this uh, classic uh, uh, aerial uh, satellite picture, is still uh, under heavy forest. That's the kind of map which was existing before. Uh, so recording the main features visible by hand, uh, on the ground and so on. And a colleague of us, Professor Jacques Gaucher, who has been working for years uh, on the ground, cutting through the forest, and was able to identify uh, the traces of reeds and ponds and mounds and canals and so on. But that took about, what, let's say 15 years. With the LIDAR, in a, a couple of hours of flying over uh, the site, uh, and a bit of treat, uh, digital treatment, we were able actually to not only confirm uh, the work of our colleague uh, Jacques Gaucher, but also to expand it over the whole area of the central anchor and to realize the densification, more or less, which uh, we can observe through the quantity of mounds, ponds, and all this uh, structure and the grids in this central part. So I, as you can see, it's help us to identify a new, a new vision of the density of occupations and modification, including, for instance, in the site of Angkor Wat, as you can see here, where um, some grid and series of mounds and ponds are appearing inside the enclosure. Uh, so basically, that was the kind of visualization we were able to do before the LiDAR, which more or less we really had no idea how the uh, settlements were, were organized around the temple. Uh, with the LIDAR, we are now able to have uh, a more, uh, more closer uh, view and, and more trustable uh, view of the organization and the pattern, the very 
organized patterns which took place into this uh, enclosure around that main uh, main jungle. So, as you can see here, the, between the mapping before the lidar and the mapping after, uh, this did not really change much on the landscape point of view. But actually, it's clear it was clearly. Uh, a uh, key component to uh, understand the densities, especially on central part, which were ancient cities. And as such, it's a, it's a great tool to start working on expansion uh, issues, on limits, densities, through uh, various chronologies. And that's uh, an example of a paper which was recently published with uh, our colleagues. As I mentioned, there was a very series of uh, LIDAR campaigns. The first one being uh, launched in 2012. Then there was another uh, expansion in Cambodia in 2015. Recently, we were able to conduct a new series of work uh, of uh, LIDAR campaign in uh, Laos with the Champa project. And we are actually planning to expand again through the Archaeoscape project directed by Damien Evans, a new series of acquisitions in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, and, and possibly Thailand, if, uh, if, we can find, if we can establish uh, such a collaboration in the framework of the uh, EFU and the Central Anthropologic Center uh, project. Um, for, uh, just to give you a, a, an example of for what it can bring to archaeological sites, which are supposed more or less to be well known, like the, the, the ancient pre Ancorian capital of uh, Samba Precook. Uh, that's, uh, we saw the first uh, vision of classical satellites. This is uh, the LiDAR uh, image. And then the mapping can be pr proceed, proceed. That's the mapping uh, developed, which clearly identify the densities. Uh, the organization of a town, for instance, here the dissociation between a kind of a monumental ritual town on the east compared to a gridded, uh, unframed, uh, in world actually, uh, density of a uh, city uh, on the on the west. Um, of course, beside the, having a new vision on ancient sites. This tool helped us to identify new kind of structure we were not even expecting. And some are very close to areas where we have been looking for, for many years. For instance, south of Angkor Wat, in a place where so many visitors have been are traveling every day to, to, to visit the temple, new structure, linear structures appeared quite strangely here under the forest. Um, and we since realized on other lighters, then this kind of uh, uh, grids uh, and linear features still exist elsewhere in other sites. So far, excavations were limited, uh, but they, and they were not able to identify actually the function of these sites. But I would like to to show you maybe another uh, another example, uh, what we call mounds fields, and the first ones. Have, Appears, for instance, uh, in the middle of the forest, you may know the Phnom Kulen, which is the hill uh, north of, uh, of, of Angkor, where the, the rivers take their uh, sources. Uh, most of you may know already this sculpted bedrock of the river, sculpted with thousands of lingas and so on. But actually, we just realized that just a couple of meters away on the edge, under the, the forest, which actually where you we don't see a thing the lidar was actually just able to identify just next to these carvings various uh, features a series of mounds uh, aligned uh, north south or east west and in covering huge areas around the river so these ones are not very well preserved but since then we have been able to identify on the Phnom Kulen not only one site, but actually numerous ones, which have more or less the same uh, the same characteristic of having this big mound uh, aligned on different occasions, different size, and so on. Uh, and that's completely new. Uh, we realize also then this kind of feature also appears in the Angkor Plain next to the city. Uh, 
uh, some showing very large fields of mounds. And some excavation has been uh, conducted during the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and they are not yet published, so I will not go into the detail of uh, the result, but uh, still the function of these fields remain a bit unclear. And we do hope to be able in the future to be able to compare two similar features which appeared in Thailand uh, during a 2016 LIDAR campaign, which remained so far unpublished and to which we collaborated at that time, uh, conducted with the finance department some uh, field surveys of this, on these mounds, which are exceptional because they are made of stone, not of sand like it is the case in Angkor. So maybe the, the key uh, to understand this feature may have to be found uh, somewhere in the area of Panam Rome. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to develop that project in the next uh, uh, couple of years. So just to, to finish, uh, just some ideas of uh, a kind of feedback about the experience of LiDAR we have been, we have been uh, conducting in, in, uh, in, in, mostly in Cambodia, but not only during the last couple of years. And we are actually ex trying to expand uh, and to be able uh, actually to to have the capacity to be able to compare this anthropization and settlement studies over uh, on other uh, civilization in Southeast Asia. One of the first uh, element of feedback I would like to, to, to underline is actually the necessity to conduct field studies, field reconnaissances. Uh, the LIDAR will not explain everything at all. And we still need a lot of uh, field checking in order to be better uh, equipped to interpret this uh, LiDAR data. So the field is not to be forgotten at all, actually. I, I would say on the opposite, actually. Uh, we need to go back to the field and we need to go back to the field with this kind of, of data, which give us a broader vision and we can know very precisely where to check on the field. Another aspect, of course, is the importance and the use of uh, this kind of uh, LiDAR data for many other aspects of heritage protection and management. Uh, it goes beyond the identification of archaeological features. It's providing also many useful uh, aspects, for instance, for land use, uh, modern land use, flood, re uh, flood risk maps. It's also, uh, it can be also developed in order to identify plant species uh, and the biodiversities uh, in uh, this kind of heritage and usually natural parks. One aspect of this uh, of this work is far to be di only digital, but digital, you know, uh, goes also with a lot of training and engagement with local stakeholders in order to um, provide the opportunity for them to be part of this uh, of the studies. It's not, uh, and of course, using uh, digital data like that is not that easy and require uh, very, quite serious training. Uh, another aspect also is the necessity to uh, work with in collaboration to provide accessibility and the dissemination of data. It's not only just for the analysis, uh, actually, that's the case we, we have been doing in Cambodia for, for years, for over 10 years now. Uh, many international teams of different nationalities, different uh, uh, research agendas and so on, have been collaborating together using actually this kind of data. And that provides a very useful platform for the different agencies dealing with heritage issues and research issues. But besides also the idea is to provide through a web portal uh, the tools for dissemination of the data, uh, which pose serious uh, technical aspects because, of course, the, this kind of data are very heavy. Uh, and, of course, this data can be used and are to be used uh, for to raise public awareness and engagement in heritage issues. It's, uh, as you can see here in this very visual uh, uh, touchscreen um, um, way, we can really uh, develop this awareness through archaeological and especially non-monumental uh, archaeological features protection. Uh, you may have heard 
documentaries also shot on this kind of aspect, on which is usually a, a nice topic for documentaries. It's a, it's also a way to bring the local heritage, non-monumental local heritage, to a, a larger global audience. And that's also a very interesting aspect of uh, this kind of uh, tool. Just to finish briefly, uh, there is a kind of a tendency to go bigger and bigger as the, the tools uh, are getting uh, more and more um, productive. Um, the, it's uh, actually the laser uh, are getting better year after years. So it's interesting to see how it started in 2009, 2010 in Belize, uh, covering about 200 square kilometers, which looked huge at that time. But then it has been expanding. Uh, Anchor, the first run was 400. And then uh, 2015, we covered 2,000 square kilometers. We just uh, recently finished in Laos, more than about 4,000 square kilometers. And we, we are expecting to, to cover about 10,000 square kilometers in the, uh, the, ne the next uh, couple of, of years. But so, so it's getting easier and easier to have large size uh, coverage. But on the other hand, the development of technologies and especially drones, UAVs, and light uh, lidar capitals help us to have the possibility now to use lidar on a much smaller site, smaller scale, much more easily than just to bring helicopter and planes and so on. But just with drone, actually, and that's also something we have been testing. And this is something which has been tested recently also in Thailand over the last year. A uh, few sites has been covered with this kind of light uh, lidar, which nowadays provide similar quality. I would not say the same kind of quality, still a bit lower, but similar and comparable. And of course, I will finish with development, uh, which are on the way, especially uh, to uh, analyze uh, this kind of heavy uh, um, data needs a lot of time. So we are also uh, in uh, there is a project to develop uh, the use of artificial intelligence, deep learning, and computer vision in order to um, make uh, to optimize um, these uh, analysis analytical phases. And that's particularly the project that Damien Evans is actually conducting at the EFU in Paris. Uh, thank you very much. I've been already probably too long, uh, and of course uh, I will be happy to to take any questions if you have. Christophe, for this uh, fascinating presentation and very uh, convincing as the LiDAR technology is very uh, impressive. Uh, so I, I, I quite appreciate your word on uh, digital deforestation. It was very <laughs> quite uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, one question I have is, um, so you mentioned all this, uh, the, the project that has already been, been done. I was wondering whether there are some case, some archaeological site where the LiDAR is not efficient where uh, it doesn't give uh, enough uh, more information. So is it always um, efficient or in some case it just no. doesn't, doesn't work? It, uh, actually, um, first, the, the first question is actually uh, what is expected from the LiDAR. The LiDAR does not work on everything. It works perfectly well uh, if you are looking for uh, the topography. As I mentioned, the LiDAR don't see through anything. It just record the, uh, it's a scan, it's recording the topography. So if you are looking for uh, ancient traces, which does not impact on the topography, it will not be as effective. On the other hand, the, the, the classic vision is to say, oh, uh, it works only under heavy uh, vegetation. If I have no vegetation, the LiDAR is useless. I would say otherwise, uh, and the experience we had show us then, of course, the, uh, the LIDAR is, uh, may bring to you discoveries under, uh, under areas which were uh, known before, of course. That's one, uh, one aspect of, uh, of the LIDAR. But the other aspect, which is usually <laughs> underestimated, is to provide a very precise topographic uh, based on areas which are supposed to be known, which can be seen on, on satellite imagery and so on, but we, we have very poor topographic documentation. So at least even for this area, 
The LiDAR will not reveal much new, but it will provide a much more precise vision over and very uh, homogeneous through large areas. And that's a very important tool for many aspects uh, of, the, of our work. And not only for archaeological work, but in, in, also for heritage management. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other question? Uh, 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 excuse me. As you have uh, experience, yes. not just uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Cambodia and Laos also, but Thai, Thailand also. You 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 was actually uh, the head uh, of the Bangkok office. I I would like to ask you mm -hmm. for the future collaboration if you could uh, propose some kind of like collaboration, uh, concrete collaboration with the fine art department. We have here present. Uh, um, uh, about three person from fire art department, one from uh, the Thai area, and one from uh, the Department of Scientific uh, Development um, Office. Could, could you propose some kind of like, uh, collaboration or uh, maybe proposition about the development of the fire art department in this area, please? In fact, we yes, uh, well, of course, <laughs> that would be it's difficult because I don't have a, a screen return, so I don't see you. <laughs> I hope you see me, but anyway, uh, so I will be delighted, of course, to to, uh, to take the opportunity uh, w during my next uh, stay in, uh, in Thailand, which hopefully will happen soon, to go into further discussion with our colleague from the finance department, and we do hope to be uh, able in the close future to discuss about a project, for instance, in Sukhothai. Sukhothai could be an interesting implementation case where uh, it's not only about the Sukhothai uh, city walls, but actually the landscape itself, including the mountain nearby and so on. So to have a global vision uh, of that could be a, an interesting aspect uh, of a collaboration, which would fit totally into uh, the ERC program than our colleague Damien Evans has been developing. Uh, but beyond this, uh, actually, we would be very uh, excited and very happy to be able to share the experience we got on various uh, projects elsewhere in Southeast Asia in order to uh, help to facilitate uh, project uh, development, uh, funding research, to uh, be able to uh, to develop this kind of, uh, of coverage on other sites including smaller ones uh, the experience we we the experimentation we conducted last year in in cambodia with drones uh, offer new possibilities uh much cheaper and somehow that may be a, a better solution especially for heritage uh, agencies like the finance department who would be interested to have maybe not 2000 or 4000 square kilometers or the whole area but actually Closer areas can be also uh, useful, and we will be uh, delighted to uh, to to collaborate on, on that and share our expertise, as well as uh, developing the expertise we provide already in 2016 and 2017 to the finance department on the study of the lidar, which was acquired at that time on the area around Padam Rong. Yeah, there are so surely many projects that we can do together between the EFIO and the Altair partners. So we're running yes. a, a little bit out of time. So Christophe, we we'll thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you in Thailand uh, very, very soon. <laughs> I hope so. I have to go back home. <laughs> have a good uh, journey to, uh, to Laos, as you are actually. Thank you. So the next uh, talk uh, will also, also be very uh, technical, as we welcome two uh, speakers. Uh, one is a uh, Professor uh, Kurt Kier, which is an, uh, actually in Copenhagen in Denmark, so uh, by video conference. So we thank him very much because it's very early in the morning for, for him. So uh, Dr. Kier is from the University of Cop Copenhagen. And we have with us uh, in presencia uh, Fabrice Demeter from uh, Lundbeck Foundation Geogenetics Center and uh, the Musée de l'Homme uh, in France. So this uh, presentation is about uh, recent DNA experiments in Cambodia and research opportunities. So I will leave you the floor to both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gregory. I, I don't see the screen, actually. No, I need, yeah. 
Can you get the hold first slide for us, please? Hold on, Kurt, hold on, Kurt. That's not Kurt's presentation. Is it? it is okay, good, good, good. good. Uh, yeah, first, first of all, let me re rectify something. I'm not going to present anything. It's court, so it's a mistake from Christophe Potier, who is too generous and decided to put my name on the presentation. Uh, court Chaos is, of a, is deputy director of uh, our center in, uh, in Copenhagen and the University of Copenhagen. And uh, he's uh, the leader of uh, our uh, environmental DNA team uh, at the center. And uh, so I give the floor now to Kurt, and I will pass uh, the slides uh, for Kurt. Can you give me the first slide, Fabrice, please? Done. Can you see The it? first slide. Yes. yes, but there should be another slide. There it is. Good. OK, thank you. <coughs> thank you for the invitation on behalf of Fabrice and myself, and also a big thank you to the EFFO, who is certainly, and Fabrice Alain and Christophe Poetier, who is facilitating our work in uh, Anchor area. And we also have a very productive collaboration with Danny, uh, Dan Penny from uh, Sydney, Australia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, yes, thank you. So just to, to, to set the scene, I can see that uh, uh, and where we are going. We are going to talk about disease, and that is our angle into the Ankara uh, and the Khmer Empire and the, its development. This is the classic scene where you can see the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the pestilence, the famine, and the war. The war part here is also the conquest. And when those four horsemen ride together, uh, societies and uh, um, empires, they crumple. That is kind of... The, the idea. If you take a look on the next slide, then you can see here it's just to put uh, the Khmer Empire, which you see on the on the uh, on the right hand of the diagram, and the approximate time of their peak periods, together with some of the other uh, big cultures and empires that existed around the, in the early modern period towards 1500 um, AD or CE. Uh, so that's kind of a thing to look into. But if you want to look into to what did disease mean in the development or the demise of some of these big structures, uh, organizations, empires, then we can see on the next slide what's been used for methods until now. It's, a, of course, a lot with the human history, the documentary sources, the written sources, of work of arts. Then there's a over in little more you can say over to the more natural science part. It would be bioarchaeology, looking at physical remains. It could be paleopathology or paleoepidemiology, looking at disease patterns. And then lately, it's uh, it's gone into looking on the genetic, especially of course where you have skeletal material like bones and teeth. That has certainly moved things along, also in the disease ways. Then, of course, you look into the genetic phylogenies, family trees, and see how that uh, and how disease might affect uh, these. So that is kind of the thing now. But of course, if you don't have any uh, skeletal material, you have a problem uh, to say something. And if you want to, just in the next slide, Fabrice, if you have to, to interpret anything, even though this is a beautiful piece of art, it can be very tough to uh, to interpret anything in terms of what kind of disease, uh, what is the aging of the disease. You can see that people are suffering, but from what you can certainly not determine. Next slide for us. <clears throat> yes, here's an overview of the last millennium of uh, some of the diseases that uh, has roamed the 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 the, uh, the world. And if you take the next slide, Fabrice, we can zoom in on the, you could say, three of the very large plague pandemic, the uh, Yenisaya pestis uh, uh, bacteria and what that caused. And there was three very large plagues that I will focus a little bit on here and see if we can reach some kind of hypothesis to work from. Next slide, Fabrice. So there was, you know, of these, uh, plagues. There was three of them, three big ones. One which have been been uh, has been uh, 
connected to the collapse of the Byzantium Empire, uh, the plague of the Jocinian. And then the second plague is what we have been calling the Black Death, at least in, in, in the, you could say, in the, in the European part of the world from around 1350s. And the third uh, pandemic was in the, is when the, just in the beginning of the industrialization from 1855 and onwards, which started in China, that one. But you can see from the percentages that it is a very potent killer. It's, uh, it's uh, the first two, it's around 50 to 60 percent of the, uh, 30 to 50 percent of the population that died from this, uh, these infections. Next, please. Yes, a little bit about what is what is a um, what is a, the plague? What is a life cycle? It's a very much a rodent, animal flea uh, to humans transfer. Means that fleas get infected from an, a rodent or an animal, and then it's so devious that a in this a bacteria, the entire pestis uh, bacteria, it creates a biofilm that block the the gut of the fly of the flea which gives you some very hungry uh, flies or fleas and they of course give you more bites and you will have more infections and then you can they can express itself in various ways one is you know the classic uh bulponic plague and then you can but then you can also have in your blood the chepsipic uh, plague and then the uh, pneumonic plague that spreads via droplets and the last two they are almost 100 percent fatal next slide please so i will present or we have been presenting here an outrageous hypothesis could it be that the black death the 1300 uh, plague uh, pandemic triggered the onset of the demise of the Khmer empire next slide Yes, let me say, give me a little background evidence why we, we, we think that we have to go into, as, as we lack like, written uh, documentary uh, from this period in um, from the Angkor and the area or the Korean Empire, besides, of course, all the encarvings on, the, on the, the monumental structures, which appear to me doesn't say much about, so much about the daily life and certainly not a lot about diseases. But they might agree, we have to go into the geological archives. And there's been done some study here. It's the one from day 2012 with the sugar core in the West Berry in the southwest corner. Next, please. And uh, what they what they came up with was a, a core around a, a sediment core of the sediment at the bottom of the lake that tells a, a history of what has been going on in the catchment and in the lake area as such and what they can see that around 13 1300 or 1308 there was a complete uh, stop in the inflow of of minogenic material which means that there was very little uh, activity around <coughs> the beret meaning that probably most construction activity uh, ceased in this area and there was a very condensed period in the in the in the section where you could see that the that the beret was was started to be overgrown and was left uh, unattended. Next slide. Dan Penny also did uh, has been doing a lot of work in this in this regard in the in the area with uh, in here it's Uncle Tom where they have uh, a call from the moat. Next slide, please. And here's the results, their main results you can say where they all the proxy. All the things they measure, all the things they take out of the core, they have been translating them into what they might say about the activity in the area of from almost a, a, a back from uh, something like 800 years as the core covers here. What does it have not burning? But how did it look with the, with the, with the forest around? Was this, what was, was this in the mode? Was the mode attended? That's what they call mode abandonment, land use, soil erosion and such. <clears throat> they can see a very marked shift where the moat is abandoned, left and start to be all grown, become a swamp around 1330. Yes, next slide, please. And uh, Carter and, and co-workers 
this is a this has somewhat more of a, a larger bracket they've looked into and collected what has been uh, been done of, uh, of the dating of the you could say in the archaeological record and they mark and highlight a period where they where there are very little material that is dated around uh, 1300 uh, 13 to 1400 exactly the same period as the other next slide please so this is a sum up that was done in 2022 by Penny and Bleach. And they the curve you can see that runs with all the crosses. That is, in, that is a, you would say, a rate for the minogenic influx to these different uh, modes, you, you could say reservoirs. And when you reach 1320, it drops very significantly. It's very interesting because the other thing that has been highlighted as as impacting uh, the the area here is the it has been the drought periods that comes in the later 1300 and also uh, flooding and then another another drought period and uh, if you try for me to push the next button you can see this could be the pestilence next famine and the next and the conquest and war, of course, over a prolonged period. This is also a, a pretty a bit uh, pretentious, maybe. But the thing is that it certainly is very interesting that you have this drop, and and they come before all the natural and you could say social political disasters that seem to hit the uh, the anchor. And it's also the 1327 is also the the last Sanskrit in, in comments that, that, that was seen uh, from this period. Next slide, please. Yes, then uh, if you look into, uh, and the source material for these diagrams, I, I, I must admit, um, I, I do not have been able to back, backtrack those. And there's also, of course, uh, there's also in the literature, people that doubt very much that, that uh, from the written record that it was, uh, Black Death in, 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 in China at this time, maybe even not in, in India. But anyways, this is, their, this, is their, this is their, you can say, their compilation of this. And this around the same time, 1320, 1330, that the Black Death roamed this area according to these compilations. Next slide. So, and, and next uh, push for the then we have a, fortunately a new method that we can use and we can use directly on these sediment archives and that's called environmental dna that would say that this is actually dna from the sediments themselves we take dna out from the out from the you could say out from the the soils the dirt for place next and the thing is that this is not to show you that <clears throat> in this is a modern setting but environmental DNA and DNA is all over in our environment. If you go out into the sea and you take a uh, glass of water or into in a lake and you sequence this uh, DNA, uh, sequence it for DNA, you will find a lot of different uh, organisms in this. You'll basically be able to monitor what is in the area. This has been known for some time, but then of course you can also use it in, a, in, in an ancient way, ancient way meaning people, animals, uh, our environment, there's DNA that has been, that has been thrown off all over the place. Next uh, slide, please. And this is the ancient part of this, uh, of this, we would say this science is not that old. And it started not way uh, to the north in what was, you know, it still is considered some of the best preserved areas for this. It's in the permafrost area of, uh, of Siberia and in, in Greenland. And it's all of, back, the founding paper was in, from 2003. So that's not that uh, many years ago. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the archives that we use, as you saw before, ice, permafrost, but also land surfaces, and it could certainly also be in these archeological sites, lakes, uh, are, are, are also a very good archive because you have a sediment archive at the bottom where you encapsulate what happens <clears> in the lake, but also in the catchment around the lake. And of course, you have the ocean. Next slide. 
And when you go out and take a call, this goes easily as it is also from a mode or, or human or anthropological uh, and, and anthropogenic features, you'll be able to to take, you know, you know, you can take pollen, you can take if you can find macro fossils and so on. But DNA is also lying in these areas. And DNA is not, as our experience is, the DNA is not leaching down into this. The DNA is very much attached to the material like mineral grains here that are that are sitting in a position in the core and is fixed in that position. So there's not a lot of leaching. It's behaving like a macrofossil. And that's important to remember here. Next slide, please. So what do we do? <clears throat> Very quickly here. We have some dirt. We put it into 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 a tube and we start to make an extraction. That is to show the extraction. And we're looking for this case in the anchor we're looking see to see if we can find some petrogen uh, DNA. That's the red here. And there's several ways to do this. Next slide, for please. So there's basically uh, two approaches. One is called PCR, and that one I'm sure many of you have been familiarized with in these uh, in, the, in our previous Corona times. Do the PCR analyze it. It's the same with DNA uh, that we use here for the ancient DNA. That's one way to do it. And then another way is to use shotgun DNA sequencing, and that means exactly what I say. You choose. As a shotgun, you spread it out and you try to find all the DNA. Next slide, please. If you do uh, the PCR, you have a you have already a pre-conceived uh, thought of what you're going to to fish out of this DNA. So you know you're going going to go in with what is called primers and fish out uh, a certain types of DNA, and then you're going to amplify that. The, the little bit problem with this method is that if you have any type of contamination in these samples, you will also multiply that by a million or billions. So you have to be very, very careful because you don't only modify the small, the small needles in the haystack you, you want, you also amplify all the rest. Next slide. So the method that we have been preferred is that we go in and extract every type of DNA that you find in a sample, in a dirt sample, or in a layer from a from a lake sediment, a moat sediment. So we sequence everything. Next slide. And and in order to that to do this, and in order to to uh, avoid contamination, I just want to show you our setup here from Copenhagen, and you have our what's called the clean up down to the right in one building, and then in a completely separate physical separate building, we have the modern, the open, where we also could do the where well, amplification and certain other and sequencing is done. But the, the, the extraction and so on is done in a very clean uh, environment in order, in order, in order to uh, avoid contamination. Next slide, please. Yes, okay, I know this is a busy diagram, but it's just to show that what we have achieved now is that if you look at the top one where you have the the pile of dirt, everything now that we do in these with the DNA is basically being roboticized or automated, meaning that when you enter a sample into the laboratory, a robot takes over and you don't see the uh, anything before it comes out of the sequencing machine in the end. Then, of course, we need you need to do all the rest of the, you could say, the geological or paleo, uh, paleo uh, ecological work, you have to do that uh, more or less as, as we do before and make age models of the cores and all that stuff. And then you have the final step is the bioinformatics. And that's a bit, that is where it becomes very important what you do here. Next, please. Because the, the such shotgun sequencing is super reliant on your, on your, on your bioinformatics. You get the raw data, but you need to uh, take these raw data and you you need to align them and and see how they fit to identify what kind of organism you're dealing with towards a reference genome and uh, and that's something that has been built up because not everything in the world is sequenced far from it but a lot of a lot of the important organisms and pathogens have been sequenced meaning that uh, like like the uh, Yetzirah pestis 
in a cypestis uh, bacteria that is quite well known now also in the ancient uh, back in time next slide please okay so what have we been doing so we have been out we know from the previous integration that i showed you from the from day at all and from and from dan penny that where there might be interesting sediments so here we have the three course that we took last year from the west Marais. next slide please yes it looks like this when you get it on board after you have filled your your sampling uh, tube with sediment from the bottom next slide and here's the <coughs> here's the result so far and what i've done here is you can see into to the left you can see that you have the ages that are transferred so far from from the previous studies uh, and we it seems that we got a little more of the beret history uh, than was seen before the final date of 500 ad that you see in the way bottom of the sequence here of 487 years, we are checking that because the minocanic layer that come after there, that shows that there is a been constructing activity in the area. So that would be a somewhat different age than the, than the millennium, you could say the 1000 year old date of when the array was being constructed that was known before but let's see what that ends up with but we also can have the layers the 1308 interval we also have that and that we have just submitted we have submitted the samples here for for dna extraction to see and what's also important to know here is we are really experimenting because it's very humid it's very as you know and it's very the water temperatures is is more than 30 degrees in this in the beret and also in the other modes meaning that the degradation of the dna could be very fast even though it might be stuck to minerals or other things it it might be so degraded but let's see i have high hopes the sediment looks good next slide for this so we have also been taking course in the along the anchor tom uh, in three places. Uh, next slide, please. There's the red dots. Yes, and here you can see it. Our the coring platform that uh, that we that we used uh, from uh, that was Dan Pennis from Australia that we couldn't use again. Next slide. <clears throat> and the interesting part is also that these areas. This is a uh, this you could call it. I call it an almost an overflow channel from inside the Angatom enclosure, uh, inside the walls, it runs out uh, to this into the into the moat. That also means that that the way that the Angatom, the whole terrain is sloping towards the southwestern end of the of the walled area, enclosed area, and then it has an overflow into this uh, channel uh, and then into the moat. It means that a lot of what you could perceive if there's any kind of waste deposit that will come this way and up into the moat, into the sediments. And that's what we like. The dirtier, the better. Next slide. And here's the results from the uh, uh, the coring results. And there's a very large, actually quite a long sequence of the last uh, from 1100 and, and above. And we also have the 1330 layer, I'm pretty sure of. And that is also being being sequenced now to see if we can find the uh, the uh, some of the plate bacteria that we're looking for. Next slide. Yes. So the way forward here, just to finish off, is to is of course first that we know in a, in a month time or so if there is if there is a DNA and what type of DNA there might be in these cores and. Uh, <clears throat> and I can tell you that, you know, if you think about it, that if you have a, a plague uh, pandemic coming into a very densely populated area as the, as the Anchor area and especially, of course, the Anchor Tom with the Royal Palace and, and, and all these things, it, uh, it could certainly get the people to start to move out uh, of this area when you see your, your fellow your fellow citizens drop dead in a very short time. You could certainly see how that might start 
to, to impact a, a society. But I will keep you updated for Brice and I on, on the results that we are that we are getting and I hope that, that we at a later stage can tell you our results so far. But it shows you hopefully that we can use this eDNA technique uh, to answer some specific questions uh, also from the geological record in, in these areas. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kier, for this uh, fascinating presentation. Actually, it's uh, fascinating how hard science can contribute and somewhat uh, bypass the classical uh, study in, in history because, uh, as everywhere, everybody knows, the, the, the fall of Angkor is still an uh, enigma for, it's the enigmatic for most people. And actually, I think that your theory is the most uh, convincing I've ever, I've ever heard. So um, maybe uh, it can be, I not maybe not about Cambodia, but in Thailand, for instance, we have chronicle that actually mention uh, plagues and disease. Not many mentioned, but some of them, like I'm thinking about uh, Northern Thai chronicle that uh, mention uh, uh, cholera uh, disease uh, uh, for the, the Mon, Mon population that forced people to move from one place to another. So of course, we don't know if these events are, are historical fact or not, but this kind of study, of course, can be uh, can be used to uh, crisscross with the historical uh, document we, we, we have. So is, does anyone have a question? Uh, well, let me just comment on, on oh, that. Sorry. Is that, you know, there must have been a lot of diseases in these societies. I mean, people living close together, like in the Ankara area, right? And, and you know, you also know there was, of course, hospitals and so on. Uh, that, has, that has been, uh, I think, something more than 100 hospitals there. And when you look about the environment and, and also... Uh, malaria and, and the dinky fever and so on, there must have been a lot of disease, but there's nothing recorded at 16 and there's very almost no skeletal material. So you have to find an alternative way if you want to try to unravel what disease might have have, uh, have impacted these societies. You, you mentioned um, briefly China and the, because we know also there are some epidemic in, in, in China. So. Uh, I was wondering whether your technique you used were uh, also used for um, uh, digging into the history of China. So, uh, can it help also to uh, to crisscross with uh, historical sources we have on the uh, history of China? Yeah. No, well, no, not 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 so far. But it has been used in other other areas, and you know the whole Black Death, uh, uh, the second uh, pandemic, has certainly been investigated a lot using skeletal material. And you can kind of see that the origin, the point of origin for the Black Death pandemic in the 1340s is moving further and further to the east as, as new material is coming. And, and there's a lot of uh, the there's a phylogeny that is certainly, uh, you know, genetic phylogeny that is evolving, showing, you know, the different strains and so uh, where they could be. And, and, and you know, I will not be surprised if we end up further to the, much further to the east than it is right now. So to understand the history of the human, we have to understand the history of the of the disease. It's another <laughs> another way. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Kier? It's a very technical <laughs> presentation, so it's a bit far away from uh, our own disciplines. Yeah, so there is no more about the hypothesis, you can say. It's, it's, of course, a, a little bit of an outrageous hypothesis to come from a natural scientist, so I hope you're not too offended with that. <laughs> so if there's no other question, I will thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Kier, who is uh, actually in Denmark. It's very early for you, so thank you very much to, uh, for being with us. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. So the last uh, presentation of this session is presented by Professor Armand Debat, who is Professor Emeritus uh, at the CNRS in France, who is actually talking with us uh, from, uh, from France. It's so very early, early in the morning for, for him. So Professor uh, Debat will uh, talk with us about the chemical characterization of Khmer stonewares from Brilam in Thailand. So we are in Thailand, but still with this, the Khmer uh, uh, culture. Thank you very much, Professor.
Alors, thank you. Dear colleagues, the results of the research that I'm going to present to you are part of a vast project devoted to the stoneware of the Anchorian period. This project sorry. This project carried out of since uh, 2008 was first initiated in order to investigate. I have some problem. Okay. To investigate the ceramic produced in the kiln sites located in Angkor region between the 9th and the 14th century AD. The aim was to characterize each kiln site from three point of view, techniques, typology, and chemical and petrographical composition. The first stage consisted in field survey conducted in different kill sites identified around Angkor for sample collection in order to provide first description and analysis. Later, this research was extended to other regions, including the Chungek Kings near Phnom Penh, and Buriram province in Thailand. Currently, we know of four main production groups for Khmer Stoneware, three in Cambodia and one in Thailand. The group located around Angkor, called the Kuren Type, the Chungek group near Phnom Penh, the Torche group about 50 kilometers east of Angkor, and the last one, the Buriram group in Thailand. Here is a map to help you to look at it, these different groups. The Kulon groups uh, takes its name from the first known site, Olong Tom, or Namrek, discovered <clears throat> at the end of the 19th century on Phnom Kulon. Some examples of Kulon of stoneware leads with elaborated design, bottles, and urns. This group of kilns also produce unglazed stoneware, of which you have some examples here. Some examples of stoneware from Shung Egg and Topshe stoneware. Essentially, brown glazed were jars with many glazed runs on the side. And the Boriram stonewares. Among the common forms are bowls. There are, they have molded bottoms, which is a characteristic of Boriram stoneware. Another characteristic is the using of small balls of clay as separator using firing. There are bronze lace stoneware, uh, see, and bicolor stoneware. <coughs> bicolor glazed objects are obtained using two techniques. The first one is the use of two clays. The first white for the grey glaze and the second with iron for the brown glaze. You can see on this biscuit. The second technique is the use of a single white clay, but with two glazes, one green and one brown. Between 2015 and 2017, the second core team conducted several surveys on the kin site in Buriram. Our surveys were mainly focused on the kin sites still visible around the town of Bancroat, based on the map drawn by the fine art departments. We have documented more than uh, 15 kin sites. We can distinguish, distinguish two groups, the first in the Lionside uh, district, further source of the map, 
where a lot of kids would have been destroyed at the Land River Dam. The second around Bankrat is today the most important. The preserved killed mounds are very rare. Most of them have been leveled for cultivation. However, even on totally destroyed queens, it is possible to collect numerous shards, as you can see in this picture. At each kiln site, several categories of stoneware were produced, both unglazed and glazed, but on some kilns, we may find higher proportion of green or of brown grays. It is the case for the kiln in Sunshine District, green grays are the most common. For example, on the band rag, rag dam site, there are very few bronze glaze on the left <coughs> and many small pots but the most of the glaze um, are bowls green bowls same thing on the band street i had site where we found a lot of green glaze bowl another site Bangkok young tree yielded mostly green glazed urns, but also unglazed stoneware. Another example of Bangkok young tree one can note the finest of the pieces, and a bottle whose shape is very close to the current stoneware. These features suggest that it may be one of the oldest kin. On the other hand, on the Bangkok Yai site, the three large kin produced mainly brown or black glaze with many uh, baluster jars. You can see sample from the clean C and D with brown and black glaze. Other samples from the kiln A, E, is the same. An important point, point would be to collect samples in order to analyze them and compare the result with Angkor kiln site and consumption site. Macroscopic observations were first made on the analyzed samples. They were carried out with a binocular magnifying glass. They show that the paste of the green glazed stoneware is essentially fine, light colored, beige, gray, or even white, like on this picture, and contain numerous fine white and or translucent, translucent grain but very few iron oxide nodules. In contrast to the unglazed stoneware and brown glazed stoneware, which for the most part have coarser pastes, dark in color and containing numerous iron oxide nodules of various sites, size, as well as large quartz grain. Here you see green glaze and brown glaze stoneware with the same past. That this case is very rare. And in many cases, it's for a uh, big colored glaze. However, at only few sites, some bronze glaze stoneware have exactly the same past as the green glaze stoneware. Analysis showed that their, their composition was strictly similar to that of green glazed stoneware. The potters sometimes use the same clay to make green or brown glazed stoneware. However, these cases are quite rare and could correspond to the early production of bicolored ware. The 
The chemical composition of each genre sample was determined by X-ray fluorescence spectrometry at the Archaeology and Archaeometry Laboratory in Lyon, in France. We now have about 350 references to characterize the production of green glaze, brown glaze, and glazed stonewares from more than 15 kin sites scattered around Bancroat and Branae. The result of this analyze confirmed that the unglazed stoneware and brown glazed stoneware have similar composition, which are clearly different from those of the green glazed stoneware. This can be easily verified from the binary diagram relating the iron and manganese oxide contents in unglazed, brown glazed, and green glazed stoneware to the silica and aluminum contents on the same stoneware. Other chemical elements participate to this distinction, indicating that the clay materials are clearly different. The potter selected their clay according to what they wanted to produce. Most of the green glaze <coughs> stoneware have been produced with raw materials we have very high silica contents, more than 80%, containing kaolinite clays. The comparison of the chemical composition of all analyzed green glaze stonewares from Buriram sites in Bancroat and Lansine district reveals a large number of composition groups reflecting the diversity of the clay material used. The analysis confirmed the existence so, of a large number of composition groups for all types of stoneware, which are not characteristic of any particular kin site. Also, some similarities have been noted. The variety of composition of the Buriram stoneware is probably related to the multiplicity of kins. The clay rose material should have been collected from multiple small outcrops at each kin site may have a different pottery practice with its own paste preparation habits. The chronological factor should not be forgotten and certainly plays a role. The chemical composition allows a clear distinction between the brown glazed stoneware of Buriram and those of the top shell groups in Cambodia. For the green glazed stoneware, the distinction is less easy. The Buriram references are clearly distinguished from one of the two reference groups of cool and stoneware, which include the Tani and Knarpo kins with very fine clay, but the separation is more difficult with production of the second group, which includes the Sorce and Anlong Tom kins. It is therefore essential to associate archaeological and typological criteria with chemical criteria when studying the attribution of wear discovered in consumption context. This result has been published in the Bulletin Archaeologique des Écoles Françaises de l'Étranger, which is an open edition journal. Another aim of this program was the establishment of a new typology of the queer stoneware. And you can see a typology of the bowl of Buriram. This has been completed and is presented in the bilingual summary books of Ankorea stoneware published by FAO and currently in press. Thank you for attention and uh, your angels for my English. So thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Deba. So it's really, uh, I'm really surprised about the variety of uh, 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 stoneware and material that are used in this uh, area. Uh, to your knowledge, is it specific, this variation, is it specific to this area or in every uh, place you work, it's the same, same variety in the material used and the technique used. No, it's a, 
particular for uh, Buriram, uh, notably the existence of bicolored uh, glazed, and uh, the production of the Buriram kills uh, get a very very big uh, variation of shape, more than for the coolant type or uh, other kiln in Cambodia. Okay, thank you. I think Christophe Poitier has a question, but he's uh, online, so I'm not sure it's possible. Let's check. Please wait a moment, Professor. Ah, we have Christophe with us. Attends, t'entends pas encore, Christophe? No. Vas-y. Oui, voilà, ok. Uh, yeah. If I may actually ask a question, even if more or less I, I may have the a part of the answer, uh, maybe one one remark first uh, was to underline the uh, importance of uh, this Buriram production in uh, Khmer Empire because, uh, um, and I think Armand, you, you you may be much more precise than me on that, but it seems that this uh, production of this site is to be fa is to be uh, found almost everywhere in in Angkor and the Khmer Empire on a very large scale. So uh, on, on your view, what, what is actually the distribution of this, uh, of this Buriram uh, production? Um, that was my, my, my first point. Uh, the second point is actually this project and site surveys and collection and analysis has been going on for more than six, seven years now. Um, what would be uh, potentially the further steps and further investigation which could be conducted uh, in the future in on this Puriram site, uh, kins or maybe other kins could be also identified nearby? Alors, for the first question, uh, the Kin Buriram uh, largely uh, supplied uh, all the Angkor region, and we can see uh, some uh, specimens, uh, some samples, uh, even in uh, Champasak. So uh, you can see the very large uh, distribution. Uh, to the south of uh, Cambodia, we have uh, uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, uh, few data. We don't know distribution, but we can uh, think it, it was the same. For the okay. second uh, question, uh, uh, <clears throat> because of the COVID, we, we stop uh, investigation or uh, on the Moriram Kim site. But uh, I think uh, it was uh, it should be uh, interesting to go on and uh, to complete, uh, in particular, uh, uh, our uh, investigation in the Randstein district. We found uh, only uh, three kin sites, but I think it's possible. Uh, it uh, would be more uh, more kills. Okay, thank you very much for both of you for question and, and answer. Does it, anyone has a other question? So in this case, we will thank uh, Professor Deba for his uh, talk from uh, from Paris. Ah, and we have one question. Are you still with us, uh, Professor Deba? Yeah, yes. Okay, uh, good because I can't see you anymore. So one more question. ขออนุญาตถามเป็นภาษาไทยก่อนนะอันนี้ได้เปรียบเทียบหาความเชื่อมโยงแต่ละที่มั้ยค่ะเอาเอ่อองค์ประกอบทางเคมีไปเชื่
comparative study, you, you have already compared the example from uh, various sites? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, you, you have made uh, an analysis from all the, the kin you have, uh, you have sampled. And you have uh, about uh, 350 uh, references for the kin side of Buriram. So sorry. So you compare with with which uh, area with Cambodian in Cambodia or other other sites? Okay. Uh, the two we compare each uh, kin site uh, in Buriram and we compare also with the production uh, in Cambodia. Ah, I see. And this example um, from the the case, uh, this example you you uh, you uh, is your own um, um, example, or you use the data of uh, the other researchers? No, it's only uh, our uh, our works, our collection sample. Uh, they they yes, are maybe. from the department of um, uh, scientific uh, bureau under the, um, um, the department of a museum uh, museum uh, of the fire art department. Yeah, yeah. maybe if I may, may Mr. Sai, you would uh, eventually also explain or recall as you have been partner uh, in the various surveys, field surveys, which has been conducted under the direction of Armand Debat, that actually, yes, the sites were uh, surveyed on the spot. Some surface collection was organized. Samplings were selected uh, in from the spots. And these samples were analyzed in uh, Lyon, in France, uh, laboratory. Um, so that's, yes, that's first-hand primary data. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you very much. We are still running a little bit out of time. So we thank you thank you very much, uh, Armand Deba, again. Uh, thanks, Christophe, for, Christophe, for your you. intervention. Can upload. And now we'll make a little break, about uh, 10 minutes, and then we will start with the last session of the, this workshop. Thank you very much. <laughs>